I would now like to introduce Chris Field, our facilitator for the panel discussion. Uh, Chris is the Perry L. McCarty Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and the Melvin and Joan Lane Professor for Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies at Stanford University. Chris will lead a conversation amongst our five speakers today. So over to you, Chris. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thanks to everyone, especially to Tom, David, Greg, Inej, and Karen for presentations that were really information packed and super insightful. I'm going to start out with a, a question that that puts the perspective of equity in the context of the major themes we heard from today's presentations. We heard a lot about an approach to solutions that's not top down command and control that's really diverse and iterative uh, based on an adaptive management. Now, how do you think that aligns with the priority that you've already outlined for solutions that are equitable as well as result in rapid decarbonization? How do you assure that there's some kind of a alignment between the equity considerations and the decarbonization results? Yeah, I, I, that's a great question. And Glad to have a chance to, because for me, it's I've really changed my thinking about it. I've really gone from thinking about that as a trade-off to thinking about it as a way to broaden support for a really difficult, necessarily long-lived project. And I mean, as I showed that kind of evolution of climate policy, I think in the past, I think people would have maybe thought of equity as kind of a, a competing goal with doing something quickly on climate change. But if we're going to be at this for the next several decades and beyond, it's got to be seen as something that benefits lots of people, um, not just a few. And so I think it's absolutely just crucial to the durability of, of the whole project. So I think it's actually been really helpful um, to, to broaden the coalition of people in support of some of these um, efforts and exactly the work that uh, Inesh is talking about having now becoming more receptive from policymakers is, is a huge advantage. So I, I just see it as kind of key to the whole the whole project. Let, let me continue to focus on this this equity aspect and I want to ask a question of Karen. You talked a lot about the availability of finance basically in the rich world, but many of the needs that are most profound are, are going to be in the poor world. And could you speak a little bit about the way Bank of America sees the um, the transfer of technologies, the transfer of learning, and the transfer of finance to the countries that are going to need that as uh, this whole agenda moves forward. Yeah, I think the the disproportionate capital that's available to the developed world compared to the developing world is real. And I think what you're pointing out is is clear in asymmetry. But you know, given the size of capital markets in the U.S. and Europe and developed Asia versus the rest of the world. <laughs> You know that that is not without reason, right? But when you think about decarbonization, clearly, you know it all gets released, carbon all gets released into the atmosphere. So this is actually a very equitable damage to everyone. But the capital available to to decarbonize is not um, symmetric. So what we're doing is um, we realized that the risk and credit uh, considerations in those countries is clearly different, right? Financing a utility scale wind and solar project in the US is totally different than financing something in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a lot of climate vulnerability. We have to help. So a lot of this is working. I hate this word blended finance because I think it's very cliche, but it really is a partnership with development banks, with export import banks, such that a GE turbine can be brought to Bangladesh, you know, a OPIC or a DFC type of government guaranteed agency can help de-risk um, you know, the first loss. Uh, and, and then the, the, the bank or investor capital can then come, come on top. Without that, you won't be able to get there. You won't, you won't be able to get the banks to take the project financing on because simply doesn't fit within our Basel III framework and all the regulations we have to comply between Dodd-Frank and the Fed and FDIC and OCC and so on and so forth. So when they want us to operate in a way that has certain liquidity and capital constraints, we need those help. We need the help of, you know, essentially a risk credit enhancement, but also potentially in certain cases, 
corporate help in terms of people that have the incentives to use their products overseas where the Exxon Bank and other export credit agencies can, can, can come in. And we have successfully done different examples, um, different transactions. We just completed a water transaction and sanitation transaction in India and Africa uh, with um, the water.org uh, organization with DFC, and that's a government guaranteed agency. So we got that finance. We would have never done that at Bank of America um, standalone basis. So I do believe that the blended finance and the partnership structures to de-risk. Um, sometimes we also need technical assistance. So we do work with World Bank, for example, in certain countries that we don't have the technical expertise. But more of those partnerships, it's very, very painful and complex. But we have to be at it. We have to continue to be at it. We also work with the WEF and UN. So that's the only way to accomplish a little bit more symmetry in the capital deployment. Let me stick with this international theme with a, a question for Tom. So when, when you hear about uh, the, the need for blended finance and the different risk tolerance of the entities that are likely to be involved in this kind of international finance, how do you see that lining up with the IEA projections? Does that introduce new challenges that wouldn't be there in the context of a of a developed country strategy or a, um, a, a direct financing strategy. Uh, thank you, Chris. That's a, a fantastic opportunity for me to say that uh, we, this very day, we published our latest report on financing and investment in emerging economies and developing markets. So um, the, the, the topic is, is spot on. Um, and uh, our report uh, has similar messages to, the, to those that Karen was flagging, that the, 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 the disjuncture between, between the, the rich world where the capital is and the, the cheap cost of capital for the rich world compared to the, 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 the orders of magnitude higher cost of capital in the developing world, even before you get to the energy sector and, and innovative technologies, just the, the country risk is so vastly different that there's a huge gap there, which really does need uh, a, a government or a, a public bank to, to come in with blended finance to, 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 to take some of that risk, whether it's exchange rate risk or, or other aspects of country risk. There's, there are multiple uh, tools out there already um, where that kind of blended finance can be developed, uh, and there really is a, a major need for it. And yes, I mean, the, the, the story is, is, is relatively simple, in, well, relatively simple when it comes to rich world financing clean energy investment in, in, in the rich world. Um, there, there are, there's $4 trillion, as we just heard, uh, going in that direction in the, developing, in the developed world already. When you turn to the developing world, that the, the, the risk differentials are great, um, and the, uh, the, the, the need for all, all sorts of different instruments is, 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 is uh, very, become very, very apparent very fast. And, and along the same line of the distribution of resources between developed country and developing country actors, David, you pointed out the real risk of a large flow of the current resources going into low quality uh, nature based offsets. What do you see as, as key levers that can be deployed in order to redirect some of that finance toward the higher quality products? like have been the focus of this whole workshop. Yeah, so um, look, I think there's tremendous inequality in the allocation of capital right now in the uh, international markets. And we can come up with all kinds of clever mechanisms to address them. Um, blended finance is the flavor of the day. Appreciated Karen's comments about cliche here. I feel like we should have climate change bingo and we should put, you know, maybe blended finance right now should occupy the center and then change it. And at some point when during one of these meetings, someone will yell bingo or carbon or whatever it is, and they'll get a prize you know, or offset maybe. Um, the, the, well, one way to deal with this is just to get the quality control problem in the nature-based solutions under control. And that requires more than third-party verification. It requires a really careful scrub of the fundamental problem around additionality. I happen to think that the problem's essentially unsolvable. Other people think the problem's solvable. Um, we should be running experiments that are serious as opposed to you know, having half a billion dollars of fraud flowing through the California market alone, roughly, maybe more. So um, that'll redirect some of the capital. But fundamentally, I think the key point is that these magical solutions that deal with the risk, you know, greater risk in emerging economies and so on. I just want to underscore what Tom said about the report, by the way, I was an advisory 
committee for that report. It's a terrific report. The IEA has done a really fantastic job here, and it opens a whole space for looking at these kinds of questions. But the 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 mechanisms that address this problem are only as good as people believe the mechanisms are really going to work. And the moment they don't believe the mechanisms are going to work, then almost all the real behavior of deployment of capital and politics gets focused on gaming the mechanism as opposed to deploying the capital to, to emission reductions. And I think right now we're there's still a huge, although there's a lot of trillions moving around, you know, trillion dollars isn't quite what it used to be, but there's still you know, still you know, more money to find a couch after a good party. Uh, it it's a lot of it still is of this kind of gaming variety where it's not quite clear how much real new capital is being deployed. Karen, you talk quite a lot about the the process that the bank uses in order to assess high quality products. Do you feel like you're making progress on this question of being able to identify and eliminate the lower quality and identify and invest in the higher quality products in this space? Yeah, we do that for ourselves. So when we think about it, you know, we think, you know, it's, it's, you know, high quality and low quality seems very um, judgmental, but it really is just what's more defendable and what's less defendable. Uh, a reforestation on a burned down land is probably more defendable than IFM in Hawk Mountain, right? So we don't want to go through some of the examples, um, but, you know, when you think about projects that people can argue, were well, you going to cut that down anyway? Or, you know, so it's just, we, we don't want to go there. We'd rather pay double the price to get a sort of less, de less debatable or more defendable offset um, than something that we have to sort of like answer questions, right? So that's how we think about it at our company. But I can tell you, we also have, have companies that come to us and that's a reality. And unfortunately, that is a reality. And people will say, I have declared, my CEO has declared carbon neutrality and net zero and the carbon emissions reduction goal by this year. So I need to buy 250,000 tons at as cheaply as possible. So then they're looking at then fill gas and certain IFM, and they're just looking for the cheapest they can buy because those are verified, right? Again, to their point, these are verified by the, the top verification and certification agencies, the top four. It's, you know, it's, it's retired on the registry. It's, you know, but the quality of that to your, all of your points may not be, you know, may not be as, let's say, beneficial to the environment as some of the other instruments, right? So I think a lot of this is, you know, we, I actually sit on uh, 1T.org, um, you know, on behalf of the bank, and we really sort of argue in terms of USDA, what's the government's role? Can they set up a verification or certification process from the US government such that we don't have to debate which NGO's verification methodology is, is, is more solid, you know, the true additionality. I think a lot of companies just want to buy a solid product, but I think the current process and the verification, you know, landscape, as you would know, is very fragmented and it takes a long time and it's very slow. And so I think that's why collectively you saw 160 million tons of CO2 offsets being offered last year. But if you look at how many billion tons of offsets, high quality offsets to your point, that need to be bought for companies to stay on this trajectory of you know, decarbonization, I think it's in the billions, if not tens of billions. So we have a massive supply and demand you know, uh, asymmetry right now because we don't have a marketplace, right? right? So we don't have a marketplace, we don't have an ecosystem that's well established. A lot of the efforts have been you know, sort of set up to do this, right? Mark Carney has the task force to scale voluntary carbon, but no one so far hasn't addressed the verification or certification question and make that as defendable to people like David as possible. Yeah, and it is critically important that there be customers who care about the quality, like the bank and like many of the entities you deal with. Uh, let me switch gears just slightly and, and ask about uh, how to avoid investments in sort of mid-stage technologies that aren't really solving the problem and, and, and tend to lock in future investments. Greg, let me turn to you on this, this one about how, how to think about uh, managing the time scale in a way that the, um, the investments that really receive the financing and receive the impetus are the ones that are you know, have a chance to really be durable and, and prevent us from locking in intermediate technologies that nobody's going to be satisfied with. Yeah, oh, that's a great question. I mean, the, the lock-in uh, 
issue is an interesting one because on one hand, as you say, there's a danger to locking in to the wrong thing. But on the other hand, we all want to lock in to something that works. Like the what Tom was talking about, cost reductions and learning curves, that's lock-in and that's the best lock-in we can get because we need these things to work, to demonstrate reliability, to get more efficient and to get the cost down. And so uh, we want to lock into the right things and avoid locking into the wrong things. So it's really a selection issue. And that is a tricky thing right now. And I think I can see from Karen's comments about, you know, trying to really focus on the ones that are going to work and pay off and, and not being too interested in, you know, experimenting and, and spraying a lot of bets in a lot of different places. And to some extent, I do think we're at a pretty nascent stage, unfortunately, with some of these technologies and, and the clear pathways are not uh, that obvious. And so what can help in this situation is to support some technological diversity. And it's not really probably the role for a bank to do that, but it's certainly a role for the public sector to do that, to maybe have some you know, niche markets, uh, 45Q is probably a good example of that. Maybe you have a higher 45Q for something that's earlier stage or has more permanence associated with it or something that, you know, maybe won't do that well in the near term, but has a longer term payoff. So I think there's some ways the public sector can really make an effort to support diversity and not just in funding research and, and doing early stage work, but doing the mid stage which I think is what you're referring to, Chris, in terms of funding some demonstrations, maybe some public procurement contracts and things to, to get some scale on some of these technologies that are still unproven, unreliable, and, and maybe not quite at the stage at which Karen's group is ready to invest. And, and when, we, when we think about the uh, importance of diversity and especially making investments in the technologies that can scale with smaller units as, as Greg has discussed. Tom, how do you see that fitting into the uh, level of aspirations that we need to have in order to be in the in the universe that the IEA is projected? Is or do you see a pathway that really takes advantage of the of the the scalability of small units, or do we need to also be committing to big projects? Uh, I, I think we go for anything we possibly can, given the the, the over, overall scale of, of what's needed. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, to, the example given was, was, was solar panels. I mean, solar farms, large uh, ground-based uh, farms are, are great and you can scale up, but, but there's also massive scope for, for rooftop solar, um, which is a completely different finance model, completely different uh, model, um, but it is perfectly scalable uh, on working with, with individual houses on, with, with, with small scale. Um, I heard the other day people even talking of, of the changing nature of the nuclear industry. Uh, and again, we, we thought we needed to scale up to bring costs down in nuclear industry, but there's plenty of examples where scaling up, scaling up has actually added costs um, to, to, to large-scale nuclear plants. Um, you get all sorts of civil engineering problems on top of the, 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 the technology issues. And the suggestion there is that scaling back on nuclear, small, small uh, small and medium modulars, modules uh, might actually be um, uh, uh, a more cost-effective way to develop nuclear. So I think we, we, we can explore every model that might work um, if it's, if it's rolling up the, on small-scale versions, then let's try that as well. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we only have time for probably one more question and I'd like everybody to weigh in on the question of uh, finding the accelerator that that all of you spoke about at some points and, and Greg showed pictures of uh, David if there if there is one key thing that needs to happen in the next few years in order for us to find this accelerator on climate action what is it well let me say something that's uncharacteristic um because I and there's a lot of moving parts here and we look for example at what Karen's talking about where she's on the, you know, mainly on the debt financing side of things. One needs to have at-risk equity finance. You have to have at-risk public sector finance and diversity for all the reasons we're talking about here. But what's happened, what's really moved the, push the accelerator button is activism actually. Um, CEOs 
who and corporate and, and political leaders who believe that if they don't get in front of this issue, that something catastrophic is going to happen to their electoral prospects or their company, totally changes the risk calculation and changes the deployment of capital. Not always for the best. You end up with a lot of bogus stuff like you know somebody runs in and buys a bunch of offsets so that people will be angry at the next company and not your company. I totally get that. But that role here, um, and I've been involved in some of this work, including recently with some of the shareholder activities, that is a different kind of incentive structure. And it is not like a carbon tax, but it has a much more seismic impact. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, Tom, what, what, what do you think is the big thing we need, the next big thing to drive us uh, on an accelerated pathway? I guess my, my reaction was to, to look at the next step after what David flagged up. After you get that activism and the political momentum, you then create the, you, you, with, with, a, with a government that's motivated and with an industry that's buying into it, you, you create a, a, a credible policy regime. And, I mean, I flagged up that when we had the, the, the jump in CCS projects for 2020, right. that comes with the, 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 the global change in incredible uh, serious climate policy that's happened in the last last few months and that well, once industry takes uh, takes as credible um, and uh, an irreversible and uh, uh, an accelerating policy world then Karen's risk assessment changes completely uh, the, the the sense of uh, unsafe assets which are going to have a, a, a lifetime cut short by by the regulatory regime or by standards or by, by public pressure, um, that changes the risk assessment. And uh, the, the obverse of that is that the, the, the business models of, of efficiency and renewables and, and clean energy tech uh, become more understood and more, uh, more people realize that these are an, an inevitability in policy and regulatory terms. So they become uh, lower risk and, and more investable. So I think it's, it's the credibility of the, the regulatory framework um, that will drive investor decisions. Um, but that regulatory comes from what David was talking about, the, the political uh, vault face as well. Karen, is, is there a sufficiently credible regulatory framework in place? And what do we need in order to find the accelerator? I think the regulatory framework is more developing the EU and the UK right now than the US, right? I think the SEC and the Fed and a CFTC, they're all studying this right now, but I do think it starts from you know, the regulatory regime around ESG disclosure, which carbon disclosure is a part of that. And then your net zero glide path and how do you, to Sarah's question, how do you even verify, validate your emissions and your emissions reduction path? All of that is not really established. And climate risk is being talked a lot, but it's not just a risk equation. It's obviously also a business bottom line um, issue. So I do think that needs to converge. That needs to be kind of finalize pretty soon so company can start report. Once you have data, you can analyze and you can, you, then you can critique. But I do think also for this particular space in terms of carbon removal, carbon sequestration and storage to really, really take off and getting that trillions of capital that we're saying that's ready to invest in the space. I do think that bridge from, you know, what David said about VC early stage P. Yeah, a lot of those companies are financed by that and grants, right? But I think a lot of that needs to bridge into potentially more bank and capital markets financing. That's where 45Q plays a major, major role. I think the rules around 45Q can be more clarified, can be less stringent. You know, why is only for industrial size, for example? So things like that can, can be expanded because cannot underemphasize the, um, the role that tax credits played for wind and solar and EV, right? So why shouldn't that play a major role in this space? And in a YB so pure, why be so restrictive, essentially? So I think that's that's going to be very needed. So the standards and regulation convergence and clarification uh, is needed. Um, I do think companies, a lot of companies voluntarily report, but the quality needs to be there. But I also really think the last thing we talk about is verification and certification. Why well, leave it to the private sector to, to imagine and, and to have room for error? The thing is, investors don't have the capabilities to understand what's credible, what's not credible. So why not have a very robust verification process such that this is the gold standard, this is what people should use. I think that's just too much of a cottage industry right now on the verification. Great, thank awesome. you. And uh, 
last word to Greg, you're the one who introduced the concept of the accelerator and talked about Operation Warp Speed, which was primarily a government funded entity. Is, is that the key? <laughs> Something like that. You know, I, I think we want to get to a point where the technology is reliable, the markets are credible, the infrastructure is supportive. And, you know, things that have worked to get there in the past, other than just a slow incremental process that takes decades, are catalytic efforts where there's something sustained for, say, five years. It was, you know, solar in Germany, Denmark with wind power, EVs in China, and the offshore wind in the UK. There's plenty of examples out there where you've got a bunch of efforts put together at the same time and it's catalytic because there's fertile ground the technologies there there's activism there's interests and there's capability and there's capital and so you do need this push and I think if we did something similar in a many different directions under CDR for something like five years then we could really get on the pathway to you know widespread deployment and cost reductions but there's there's got to be something intentional I think a lot of it has to come from the public sector in order to get these other pieces to really engage in a big serious way that's sustained.